The Mass Effect universe is vast, expansive, incredibly well interconnected, complicated at times, but ultimately one of the most interesting and satisfying science fiction universes to learn about. But if you're new to Mass Effect or returning to the franchise after playing it for the first time when it came out, you may have noticed by now that it can be a lot to remember all of the different species or recall how each historical event in the Mass Effect timeline affects another one and so on. That's why today we're going to be taking a brief look at one of the most important pieces of lore in the Mass Effect universe, the Rachni Wars. We'll cover the basics first, the who, what, when, and where, that sort of stuff, and then we'll dive into more specifically why the Rachni Wars is such a key event and how it directly impacts the Mass Effect trilogy. The Events The Rachni Wars is the name given to the conflict that lasted roughly 300 years between the Rachni species and the predominant forces of Citadel space in the Milky Way galaxy. It started around 1 CE immediately after a Solarian exploration team discovered the Rachni in a previously unexplored system. The Solarians had found and activated a newly discovered mass relay which led them to the Rachni home system. After the Rachni Wars, this is ultimately what led to the galactic law restricting the activation of dormant relays that are linked to unknown parts of space. Despite their insect-like appearance, the Rachni are an intelligent species and by the time the Solarians had discovered them, the Rachni had already managed to become spacefaring, although they did not have faster-than-light capabilities. When the Solarians appeared in their system, however, the Rachni promptly captured them and were able to reverse-engineer the Solarian ship's FTL drive. With faster-than-light travel achieved, the Rachni were able to reach the system's mass relay and began pouring into the rest of the galaxy. And thus, the Rachni Wars had begun. The Citadel species tried to communicate and negotiate with the Rachni, but to no avail. They were a completely alien force, hostile and aggressive, and spreading rapidly. It wasn't until 80 CE, 79 years after the Rachni Wars had raged on, that the Solarians uplifted the Krogans by providing them with advanced technology beyond anything the Krogans had previously been able to develop themselves. Armed with ships and weapons from the Solarians, the Krogans were deployed as shock troopers to fight the Rachni under the harsh conditions of their native planets and in the subterranean layers where they lived. The natural toughness and aggressiveness of the Krogan was the only match for the Rachni. And after approximately 220 years of waging war on the Rachni, the insect species was pushed back to their home planet, defeated, and ultimately wiped out, being declared extinct in 300 CE. As a reward, the Krogan were given multiple planets to use for their own expansion in addition to the technology they had previously been given by the Solarians. Ultimately, this would lead to an insatiable thirst for even greater expansion by the Krogan and what we would eventually come to call the Krogan Rebellions. But that's a story for another time. Why it matters. The events surrounding the Rachni Wars led to many other major developments in the galaxy, either directly or indirectly. In fact, the Rachni Wars may be the single most important event in galactic history if you're judging by how many other major events stem from it. Firstly, the Solarians activating a dormant mass relay in order to even discover the Rachni in the first place led to a galactic law strictly forbidding this practice in the future. You see, some mass relays are what's considered a primary relay. A primary relay only connects to one other mass relay, another primary relay, typically thousands of light years away. Secondary relays can connect to multiple other relays, but only within a shorter vicinity, typically hundreds of light years. If a primary relay is considered dormant, it means that no one knows where its partner relay is located, no one knows where it leads to, and therefore the council outlawed using dormant primary relays so that no one would ever accidentally discover a hostile alien species like the Rachni. But because of this law, when humanity first made its way into Citadel space in 2149 after having discovered the mass relay in our own solar system, Early human explorers began activating any relay they could find, not yet fully understanding how relays work. When the Turians encountered human ships doing this, they found those Alliance vessels to be in violation of galactic law and attempted to intercept them. This led to ship-to-ship -to -ship conflict and ultimately to the First Contact War, or as the Turians referred to it, the Relay 314 incident. Secondly, and most notably, the Rachni Wars led to the Krogan Rebellions, as we just mentioned. Instead of being satisfied with the rewards they were given for helping defeat the Rachni, the Krogan figured that they were the strongest force in the galaxy, and that they should just take what they want by force, since this is normal in their custom. The Turians were enlisted as the primary military force to combat the Krogans, which led to heavy losses on both sides. 
This ultimately led to the third major ripple from the Rachni Wars, which was the Salarians developing the Genophage, the genetic virus that severely reduced Krogan fertility, leading to a drastic drop in their overall numbers over a term of years. This drop in population finally gave the Turians an opportunity to win the conflict and subdue the Krogan, but the damage done from the Genophage was seemingly permanent and the Krogan's history would be forever altered because of this. The Turians, for their part in fighting the Krogan, were given a seat on the Citadel Council, joining the founding members, the Asari and the Salarians, to make up the Citadel Council representation that we see at the start of Mass Effect 1. The Turians gaining a seat on the Council makes at least the fourth major historical event that happened as a result of the Rachni Wars. The First Contact War and the Krogan Rebellions are some of the most important events in the Mass Effect universe because they largely define how humanity and Krogans are viewed at least at the start of Mass Effect 1. And arguably, these major events never would have happened were it not for the events surrounding the Rachni Wars. The Turians being on the Council, mistrust of humans, Krogan ostracization, and the state of Krogan biology after the Genophage are all reasons why I think the Rachni Wars were so crucial. Thematic Meaning the Rachni are definitely viewed as monsters by most of the galaxy, at least at a glance and early on, and you may think that that's an appropriate categorization, but through the events of Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, we begin to see that there's more to the Rachni than just aggression and territorialism. The Rachni were always explained as being an intelligent species, capable of developing their own technology and even achieving basic space travel. They were never described as truly unthinking, savage monsters, but more so that something about their nature was so aggressive and territorial that the net effect of their behavior was essentially indistinguishable from monsters, especially if effective means of communication could never be established. But in Mass Effect 1, the Rachni Queen manages an effective means of communication, and rather easily. So why did the Rachni Wars happen? Why didn't the Rachni communicate telepathically with the Asari back then? Well, in Mass Effect 2, there's a clue given. An Asari on Ilium representing the Rachni Queen, that is, if you let her live in MV1, will tell you that something affected the Rachni ancestors. She says that what the Rachni Queen has told her is hard to translate from Rachni language, but that it was akin to mind control. She also mentions that the Rachni Queen believes that Shepard is fighting against the ones who did this to her people, leading Shepard and many players to believe that she means the Reapers. This makes a little more sense when you consider what the Rachni Queen said herself back in MV1. She says that, quote, a tone from space hushed one voice after another. It forced the singers to resonate with its own sour yellow note, end quote. We have to keep in mind here that the Rachni communicate through something like telepathic song and that something like color often denotes intonation or emotion. After learning about the Reapers and indoctrination, this statement from the Rachni Queen certainly seems like that's what it could be describing. The Reapers are known for their indoctrination ability, and we also know that they always leave an emissary in the galaxy, even when they're not actively enacting their cycle of harvesting. So this is at least plausible, if not likely. But in the Mass Effect 3 DLC Leviathan, we get yet another theory. Dr. Garrett Bryson speculates that it was actually the Leviathan, the ancient race that became the basis for the first Reapers, who were mind-controlling the Rachni. The Leviathan also have mind-control abilities, and Bryson believes that they were trying to build up an army of obedient thralls in order to fight the Reapers. Bryson tries to use patterns of Rachni activity to possibly find Leviathan artifacts, but that turns out to be inconclusive, meaning this theory is still possible, but not confirmed. Regardless of what ultimately led to the Rachni Wars, thematically the Rachni are clearly meant to be a tale of caution. Not just about what can happen with an unknown species in an unknown part of the galaxy, but about what happens when you misidentify a complex intelligent species as merely monsters meant to be defeated. Surely, the Rachni do pose a potential threat. This is seen clearly in Mass Effect 1 when, even if you spare the Rachni Queen, you can still find listening posts on the fringes of known Citadel space where aggressive, hostile Rachni will attack you no matter what. So not all Rachni are friendly, obviously, but likewise you can encounter some that are not hostile either. The ability to recognize potential threats but also to recognize the potential for prosperity through alliance is key to exploring a vast and dangerous galaxy. The Rachni are an incredible example of player choice getting to directly interact with a challenging and nebulous moral issue. The thematic significance of the Rachni really needs more time to be explored fully, but if you'd like to hear more about it, you can watch my video, The Essential Truth of Mass Effect, where I talk more about this in depth during the Novaria section of that video.
For now, this wraps up our look into the Rachni Wars and why they are so important to the Mass Effect universe. If you like this video, please consider hitting the like button, and if you'd like to be informed of all future videos, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. I'm working on an essential truth about Mass Effect 2 video, but that may take a while since it's more of a long-form topic. I am also working on some shorter videos, like, I don't know, maybe one of them will be called Why Mass Effect 2 is so overrated. I know, I know, bear with me, at least let me make the video before you judge me for it. <laughs> but um, we've got, I've got more stuff coming out, so hopefully you will stick around for all of that. As always, thanks for watching, and thank you for listening.